R-rated films are supposed to push your buttons. With freedom to deliver language, blood, nudity, and drug use, you can provide lots of provocative material. In some instances, though, R-rated movies use the creative freedom of their rating for less savory purposes. These are the films that go too far. Every generation gets their own take on the classic story The Most Dangerous Game, and this generation's incarnation came with The Hunt. This Craig Zobel film concerns a group of people who wake up and find out they're being hunted for sport, like any version of this tale does. The twist this time, though, was the story got filtered through the modern-day political zeitgeist with the hunters being left-leaning elites, while the victims were coded as conservatives. On paper, it's easy to see how the project received a green light as something that, in the vein of Team America, well, police could generate political discourse while drumming up ticket sales from moviegoers who wanted to be part of the conversation and the dark humor. However, the marketing for The Hunt inspired a wave of unforeseen controversy, largely from right-leaning news organizations. It even garnered an implied response from former President Donald Trump, who accused Hollywood of merely trying to stir up violence. The cause of all the brouhaha was that many saw The Hunt as endorsing violence against conservatives though this seemed to ignore how the conservative characters were the heroes of the movie. Still, the uproar over the hunt had a sizable impact and inspired the film to get delayed a whole six months. When it came time for this generation's most dangerous game, perhaps the filmmakers tried to push a few too many buttons. R-rated comedies can sometimes draw flack for getting too racy with certain jokes, but the interview inspired a whole other level of vitriol. The film about two goofballs getting pressed into assassinating Kim Jong-un drew negative responses from North Korea, especially a scene depicting the leader's gruesome death. In fact, the film was so controversial that it inspired a hack, apparently stemming from North Korea, that leaked countless pieces of sensitive information all stemming from distributor Sony Pictures. Things got even crazier when the hackers eventually graduated to threatening extreme violence against movie theaters that screened the interview. The consequences of the film's provocative humor were swift. By mid-December, the movie's theatrical release was largely canned. But that wasn't the end of the interview. On the contrary, the movie continued to inspire widespread discussion on how to respond when violent threats are made against artists. In the years since its release, the interview actor and co-director Seth Rogen has been upfront on what a grueling experience it all was. Rogen said to Cinema Blend, truthfully, after the interview, co-director Evan Goldberg and I were a little traumatized, I think. Like many of Rogen's comedies, the interview was something that could provoke laughs but was also meant to push buttons but nobody could have expected the outsized and unprecedented response its material received. The anthology comedy Movie 43 provides more stars than there are in the heavens across its various individual segments. Whereas wall-to-wall -wall crudeness in other comedies can help unearth some kind of deeper truth about humanity, Movie 43 is now widely regarded as one of the worst comedies to ever hit theater screens. The participation of movie stars ranging from Hugh Jackman to Richard Gere to Emma Stone couldn't help elevate the film. The only conversation drummed up by this box office dud was a handful of horrific moments that showed the film's desperation to wring yucks from moviegoers. Movie 43 employed yellowface, incest, and a closing sequence largely focused on physical abuse being hurled at a character played by Elizabeth Banks. Movie 43 embraced the idea of overloading the viewer on shocking material. Though the movie pushed the boundaries of what the R rating would allow, Movie 43 was hollow vulgarity to its very core. Released in 2011, The Hangover Part 2 drew some heavy criticism for going way too far in its attempts to be funny. For example, many people were outraged when the character of Stu learned that he slept with a transgender woman. We didn't get married, did we? Of course not. We just have some fun in the shot room. The depiction of this revelation as being disgusting was correctly labeled by many as an example of bro comedies using blatant transphobia as a substitute for actual comedy. Garnering even more media attention at the time was a photo in the end credits. The image parodies an actual photo taken in the Vietnam War of a South Vietnamese general executing a prisoner. The moment was dubbed by critics like Roger Ebert as a desecration of one of the most famous photos to come out of the Vietnam War. Here, fans were disappointed that a movie that was all about shock value crossed over from providing adult-skewing gags into outright disrespect. Zack and Miri Make a Porno is actually a sweet movie when you get right down to it. One about lifelong best friends who may actually have romantic feelings for one another. However, the fact that it had the word porno in its title meant the film already rubbed some moviegoers the wrong way. This was especially true in the movie's marketing. 
which kicked off with a poster that proved so suggestive that it ended up getting banned from being shown in movie theaters. Sometimes a movie that stirs up this much controversy can ride all the publicity to sizable box office success. Unfortunately, none of these marketing troubles inspired much interest from moviegoers. Released at the very end of October 2008, Zack and Miri Make a Porno ended up sinking without a trace at the box office. The Kevin Smith comedy, despite featuring raunchy scenes like Justin Long as an adult film star listing off the titles of movies he's appeared in, is ultimately a film that wants to tug at your heartstrings. Too bad its marketing garnered a reputation for being all the wrong kinds of boundary pushing. Released in 2007, The Hills Have Eyes 2 is a kind of schlocky horror B-movie that audiences tend to watch because of its tasteless material. Graphic violence especially is a forte of this subgenre. However, this particular horror sequel used its sensibilities not to depict over-the-top violence, but to continue a long tradition of using sexual assault in a throwaway manner. The Hills Have Eyes 2 centers much of its plot on the prospect of deformed mutants capturing human women for the purposes of forced breeding. The movie's emphasis on this element is made apparent in an opening scene, one depicting an unnamed woman trapped in the mutant's basement solely so she can breed children. Before she can establish even the barest personality, she's slaughtered after birthing a stillborn baby. Critics like Scott Tobias took The Hills of Eyes 2 to task for resorting to such a shallow depiction of sexual assault, as well as for not giving any of the women in the film basic character development. While some Grindhouse movies like Abel Ferrara's Ms. 45 have garnered praise for using grimy exploitation cinema to thoughtfully explore the perspective of a sexual assault survivor, the tactless treatment of sexual assault in The Hills of Ice 2 is just plain appalling. The 2007 Uwe Boll movie Postal opens with a sequence depicting Flight 11 just moments before it hits the North Tower, beginning the 9-11 terrorist attacks. In this version of the event, the two hijackers piloting the plane decide to abort the mission, only for the passengers to break into the cockpit and inadvertently cause the plane to crash into the tower. A sequence like this was always meant to establish the tasteless and, if the general critical reception is any indicator, humorless aesthetic of the movie ahead. But the film's opening gag was perceived by many as way too provocative, to the point that one of its actors believed it cost the film its commercial potential. In the book My Year of Flops by Nathan Rabin, performer Dave Foley remarked, I think that crashing a plane into the Twin Towers at the start of the film hurt it. Postal, like its video game source material, wanted to shock and offend, but it seems that it went above and beyond the Call of Duty in its opening sequence, which took things from vulgar comedy to just plain vulgar. This Cuba Gooding Jr. and Horatio Sands story concerns two men who enlist in a singles cruise, only to discover it's exclusively for gay men. They then pose as gay while trying to get closer to women who work on the boat. The comedy is full of jokes about straight men being terrified of the very presence of gay people and how gross the thought of two dudes kissing is. Critics savage the film for its rampant homophobia, though many writers also slam the movie for being too tedious. Rita Kemley of the Washington Post, for example, remarks that the tired and familiar attempts at comedy were just as insulting as the rampant gay panic material, adding that, it's time many of the movie's more offensive gags went back into the closet. Few films of the 1990s are as controversial as Natural Born Killers, a tale of murderous lovers Mickey and Mallory, played by Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis. Intended by writer and director Oliver Stone as a condemnation of the heavy presence of violence in the media, the general response to the movie is still divided today over whether or not the film achieved its intended goals. Critic Jeanette Marslin, for instance, observed that the movie seems to be more in love with graphic violence than critical of it. Marslin observed, While Natural Born Killers affects occasional disgust at the lurid world of Mickey and Mallory, it more often seems enamored of their exhilarating freedom. Critics who interpreted the film as being more of a love letter to this kind of behavior saw Natural Born Killers as a lot of ultra-violent noise without much of a purpose. Similarly, much has been written about how the film's treatment of indigenous cultures is almost as stomach-churning as its most gruesome instance of violence. With this 1994 film, Stone meant to make something that inspired a reaction in people. He succeeded, but unfortunately, it inspired a whole lot of critiques that Stone had made something as indulgent as the elements of society he intended to condemn. You'll never understand, Wayne. You and me, we're not even the same species. I used to be you, then I evolved. Revenge of the Nerds has often been seen as a film championing the downtrodden, a comedic form of voyeurism wherein the oppressed could live out their greatest fantasies. Now, for many, Revenge of the Nerds is seen as trivializing rape culture. 
This is most apparent in an infamous sequence where the character of Lewis pretends to be the jock Stan so he can sleep with the quarterback's girlfriend, Betty. It's meant to be a cheer-worthy sequence in the movie itself, but it registers to many now as an endorsement of sexual assault. Director Jeff Knew himself has recently expressed regret over ever including the scene in the film. In 2019, Knew told GQ, I've heard criticism a lot this year because of the Me Too movement. At the time, it was considered sort of a switch. It's not excusable. If it were my daughter, I probably wouldn't like it. The R-rated events of Revenge of the Nerds were intended to be seen as conventional escapism, but it's apparent to many now that the movie is more insidious than humorous. In his voyage up the river to find Marlon Brando's Colonel Kurt, Martin Sheen's Captain Willard sees a wide array of horrific and unforgettable sights that lay the horrors of the Vietnam War bare. Unfortunately, viewers are also exposed to a terrible sight late in the film. For a climactic scene involving a ritual performed by an Ifagal tribe, a water buffalo is killed on screen. This was apparently a real-life practice that was already underway before cameras started rolling, with director Francis Ford Coppola filming the ritual as it occurred. While intended to be a visual parallel to Willard's plan to assassinate Kurt with a machete, the sight of an animal killed on screen is jarring enough to render that thematic undercurrent irrelevant. Decades after the film's release, Coppola has stood by the scene, reaffirming that he was merely documenting reality itself. Coppola said to USA Today, I did not direct it or anything. That was the way they do it. To prove his point, Coppola made sure to emphasize that he refused to have an extra water buffalo around to kill in case extra takes were needed. Despite Coppola's statements, this scene of animal cruelty stands out in Apocalypse Now as horrifying for all the wrong reasons. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.